So today, uh, I'm joined by singer, rapper, producer, and parent-to-be, 93 Feet of Smoke. How are you doing today? Blessed, blessed. How are you doing today? I'm not so bad. Um, now, I could, you know, go into deep de- uh, detail, introduce you, but I'm actually going to turn the mic towards you uh, and just kind of ask, in your own words, uh, what is it uh, that you do? Oh, man, I do a lot. <laughs> it's a loaded uh, question. I do, I do a lot of writing producing mixing mastering engineering i do a lot of merch uh for myself for other people i do i do writing producing for other people i do a lot of gardening let me see what else that's kind of that's kind of the gist of it yeah a lot of work for yourself a lot of work for other people and then gardening kind of mm-hmm. sums it all up yep. um so yep. you know you've, you've been around the block once or twice and you've been around for a minute especially in the scene until so we can kind of establish a loose timeline of events um you know from back then to present day to kind of get the background uh so we can travel back uh in time to 2015 when you have the first sort of public songs on your account and honestly if you want we can travel back even further third grade you see your classmate do kung fu to beat it by michael jackson you get the cd the whole yeah. deal yeah um you know Nerd you start, moment. sparking that passion for music right away um, but, uh, you know, 2015, those are your earliest public songs on like SoundCloud in the form of like Harvesting Moons, Ain't Talking About Shit, other tracks like that. So, so what is the general mindset behind making music at this time? And, and what is the initial spark that, you know, made you say, Hey, this might be something that I want to do. Ooh, total experimentation. Shout out my old roommate, Brian. He gave me Ableton, uh, back in like 2011, I think it was maybe 2012. Yeah. And I was just experimenting, you know, just having fun with it. Cause uh, we like to, you know, jam and just play guitar, bass, drums with everybody. But uh, I didn't really realize production was a thing. Like, I didn't realize dolls were a thing. Like, I used GarageBand, but I didn't know, like, oh, you can actually make, like, good music on the yeah. computer. You know, so it was just, like, experimenting, having fun, really. That's kind of how the whole early song started and just, you know, emotional outlet type thing. Yeah. Were, were there any sort of, uh, you know, you know, maybe once you find out, oh, you know, uh, instrumentals and stuff can can be made really uh, without instruments, uh, all from the yeah. magic of my computer. You know, was there any, you know, sort of early sounds that you were pulling from scenes that you were inspired by? And, you know, growing up around the DMV and local scenes uh, definitely had influence as well. So, like, what were you pulling from at the time? Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. Like at the very beginning instrumentally i was pulling from like straight jungle and drum and bass and just messing with that and then when i tried to mess with vocals definitely pulled heavy from black cray and uh you know young lean bones that kid he went by that kid back then like i think it was like 2011 2012 the early facebook bro like i was friends with everybody on facebook like even when bexy was back on facebook uh if you know you know like uh we were, yeah, we were just kind of pulling from that kind of thing and messing with the vocals. Like the first, some of the first vocal tracks literally sound like, like so weird. Like I was trying to do black cray flows and they were terrible, <laughs> terrible, bad. And then, yeah, kind of just progressed from there. Yeah. And, and, you know, since then, you know, you have that's like very cloud rap sound. You have maybe a bit more of like an aggressive emo sound. Uh, and then, you know, fast forward, you've gone through a lot of change and evolution um, throughout the genres, the inspirations. And so in the year 2024 now, what does, you know, a, a 93 Feet of Smoke song look like? What's the assembly line uh, from start to finish, you know, that produces a finished song? That is the question. Yeah, that I'm sure I'm sure it changes a lot. Um, you know, right now I feel like I'm just like in a cocoon, like I'm kind of evolving and I'm like trying to figure out all these different things. Like I really dove into sound design, like, uh, recently the past six months or so and like fully learning how to do from scratch synthesis. And so that's definitely driving the music right now, like heavy synthesis, like no guitars, no more guitars on the next album, probably at all. Um, maybe like one song and then total like uh synthesis from scratch so definitely leaning full experimental because i'm coming off of like a two album record deal where they were heavily you know leaning towards the full band sound so i was like cool let's do it a shot you know uh won't know if i don't try right so i did that um not really like my favorite most proudest music to be totally honest because it didn't like I had co-writers and shit. I had co-producers. Yeah. It wasn't totally me. I learned pretty quickly that that didn't make me happy. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, and so oh. now at this point, it's just like you know, I'm I'm off of the back end of that more full band oriented record deal. Now I can just kind of do whatever I want. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know. It's weird, man. Like right now, I feel weird. Like I feel like old, and like all these new kids are coming up. Like I'm working with some kids that are like 15, 16 years old, and like yeah, like like that shit. Like um, yeah, it's it's just so strange. So I definitely feel the weight of the age. And I'm kind of leaning a bit towards production overall, honestly. And like, you know, just kind of like, I think that's where like I'm yeah. most skilled is like production, like songwriting. I'm okay at, like I'm better at it when it's coming from a place of pain, but I'm generally pretty happy now. So sometimes it can be like, like, why am I, do I have anything to say right now? You know, sometimes I don't. A lot yeah. of times now I'm just like, dude, I don't know, like, I don't really know where I'm going, but it's it's always been like that. You don't really know where you're going. You just do your best, and then you end up wherever you end up. Yeah, exactly. You know? and, and I think it's interesting that you say, you know, you sort of have have gotten to this point where it's like, oh, I, I feel good, and uh, a lot of, like, my best or biggest songs whatever came out of a place of pain. I, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, Bummer, which was released in 2018, your, your first full-length album, I know that now uh, you that lyrical content doesn't resonate with you as much anymore, something that you've actually called a blessing. Um, so in a yeah. scene, in a scene where you find trends and emotions and relationships move so fast, you know, what value do you find in, you know, maybe things you've made you can no longer relate to? Well, you know, it's served its purpose and it is still there until the servers are wiped. Hopefully it happens at a much later date than a yeah. sooner date. But eventually everything on Spotify will probably come crashing down. But until then, these songs hopefully can, you know, be a place of uh, solace for those people currently experiencing those emotions. So it's not for nothing. It's it's yeah. all good. Like it's all it's positive energy transmutation from negative energy into a microphone into a computer with you put a lot of energy into songs you know and then songs go out and then you know uh resonate with people and it's great and it's it's a beautiful thing and and it, it definitely is a a bit of a strange thing too to have have uh, so many people uh, have so many different opinions on stuff you've made even though like their opinions don't really matter, but of course it influences you a little bit or it's like, yeah, exactly. People, people say they want the old shit, but they don't actually want the old shit. If I was to drop some old stuff, like they don't actually want that. Like it's just nostalgic, you know? Well, yeah. It's like the idea of that sort of uh, time period in the listener's life where it's like, yeah. oh, like we, we want the old shit. And it's like, well, I'm not making old shit. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way towards like a lot of music as well like i only like the old stuff for a lot of music so i totally you get i totally it, yeah. get where they're coming from yeah um you said you said that like a lot of people that you're working with you know are are, are younger you're maybe more focusing on on endeavors more related to production and, and and producing um i mean do you think that this is an environment like an underground music in general or maybe more genre specific scenes do you think that it's an environment that does sort of necessitate uh you know i guess more or less keeping up with the times Double-edged sword, okay. for sure. Like, do not trend hop. I firmly believe that trend hopping, like, you can do it, and you might find some success in it, but the core fan base and the core of, like, your your identity as the brand is going to not be strong because you're trend hopping. Yeah. So if you, if you want to be involved with shit that maybe, like, you're not, it's not your scene, but, like, you have mutuals and stuff, like, that's why it's great to know how to engineer, how to write, how to mix people, produce people, you know, because you can be involved that way. You don't have to, like, be the face of it. Yeah, you know, I mean, involved in that creative process without being like, this is my thing now. Yeah, yeah, because that's, like, that's not it. It's not, like, unless you actually feel that way, but I think it's super obvious when you trend hop. I would have to agree. Um, mm. And, you know, on the topic of identity and, and branding, you know, this sort of like image that you cultivate for yourself uh, a while back, you once described your music as an intersection of skateboarding, fashion, the crunk era and pop punk. <laughs> it was a description that you once used. That's true. So how would you say uh, this is a, a, you know, a bit of a, a double uh, twofer. How would you say that description holds up today? Uh, and is there, is there anything I guess you would you would change about that? Now I would say 
you know, it, there is a different intersection for the different time periods. And I okay. think that was probably true for the time period that I said that, which I think was like 2022. That sounds maybe. about right. Um, cause I was probably drawing from more of that stuff, but right now it's, it's definitely full experimental. Yeah. Totally experimental stuff. Um, none of it's out, but I'm, I'm working on an album. Who knows? Well, yeah. and, I, and I think that sort of like spirit of experimentation, especially after having like a, an established career uh, is important, you know, because since, you know, the creation of 93 Feet of Smoke uh, as a name, as a brand, as a musical entity, uh, you've released like four full length albums and you've done multiple tours and you've amassed millions of plays for your music. Uh, and so by this point in your career as a matured artist, how has your perspective on making music changed as you've uh, continued to garner more success, you know, or has it changed at all since maybe you've established it as a career? Dude, that that's a very good question thank you <laughs> and this is something that i'm sure a lot of people uh kind of that have been in the industry for like almost 10 years like myself have probably came to and like have gone through this this type of experience but you know this shit goes from uh totally experimenting and jamming with your friends to like your livelihood your paycheck mm -hmm. your rent your mortgage your bills your lights like so it sucks that that it happens but it's a blessing that to be here right so how do you how do you differentiate um this is my career and i got here because i'm being creative and being authentic to myself yeah. how do you not let the money affect your creative process and how do you not let like the the click the likes the engagement like whatever influence what you're posting like it's really really difficult and I don't think many people talk about it because you're you're constantly in a feedback loop of what you put out and what people say back to you and it affects you even if you say like I don't care like it does affect you. Yeah. So um yeah, man. I honestly forgot the question because that shit made me start thinking. <laughs> oh, I mean, you're good. It's just like, you know, how perspectives uh, on, you know, making music and this, you know, monetizing a creative outlet. I talked to a Polarm recently in an interview uh, and Polarm mm -hmm. kind of talked about how it's like, oh, yeah, music is this emotional outlet. But like uh, if I, you know, I, I can't stop. Like I'm, I'm I'm at a point in this where like this is what I rely on, my my clothing brand and my yeah. music. So if I stop doing it, that's I'm kind of fucked, essentially. Yeah. So it kind of changes, yeah, it changes your perspective on like what it means to have an emotional outlet when that emotional outlet is monetized. Yes. Yes. And it's the same with YouTube. It's the same with all these creators. And like, so I'm always like looking at new creators that are like in their first five years of creating. And I'm like, bro, wait till you're at 10 years. Like this shit is crazy. Yeah. Like it, it's a, it's definitely a blessing, but it's weird, man. Like getting older and not wanting to be perceived and you know wanting to kind of live in a little bubble i guess and i don't know man the internet <laughs> the internet is a crazy place lately i don't even like want to be on my apps and stuff and then i'm like oh fuck i'm not promoting myself and then i'm like looking around i'm like okay i can't stop promoting myself now like yeah now it's like you it. can't fall behind no yeah so it's it's like it's it's a grind and with any grind you get churned into sand eventually. This grinds you a little down. pebble, little by little. And you ho hopefully, you know you're very coarse rock and hard like a diamond, <laughs> and you can't get ground up into a fine dust that will sprinkle in the wind. But you know what? That's very poetic. That's a great way to yeah, put it. You, yeah. You know what? Like I've worked so many shitty, shitty, horrible jobs, and been so poor so many times in my life that I'm just. Every time I try to like stop myself and be like, that is such a privileged emotion you're going through. Yeah. Get, get it together. Like get back to it, you know? <laughs> it keeps you on that grind. Mm hmm. Um, and, you know, speaking of grinds and, you know, just general things you do as a musician, um, you know, I, I brought up that you've done multiple tours over the years. I mean, you've been touring since like what, 2018, 2017? Where, where All My Friends was a while ago. I don't know if that was your first one, but. I think that was that was the first one. It was like 2017, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I also know that you've had occasionally a bit of a tumultuous time touring. You've had uh, equipment trucks broken into, had stuff stolen. Uh, you've had stuff lost in ice storms. Most recently with the Allentown show. Uh, so, what is some verified 
uh, 93 feet of smoke advice for kind of keeping yourself sane, uh, traveling across the country, losing money, performing your music live. Don't do it. Don't do it. That's your big advice. <laughs> that's, my, that's my honest, <laughs> like I'm, I'm totally honest right now. Like the most opening slots you get, like as even someone like, you know, like me, like you, you might be getting like offers of 350 a night. Yeah. If you have at least four people on your team, and you're not going to be able to do this shit alone, you can't do it by yourself. Don't even think about it. If you don't have a spot on someone else's bus, and if you have to come up with the transportation, the logistics, the merch, uh, you you're not gonna you're gonna fuck yourself. Yeah. Trust me. It's gonna cost you at least like. It depends how much you want to sleep in the van. If you're cool with sleeping in the van, and eating shit, whatever, do that at 18. You can do that. You can like make it, but like. I'm not trying to do that right now, and it costs me like a thousand dollars a day to tour. So, I just like, Jesus. dude, either I get to that point where like I can make more than a thousand dollars like off a of guarantee a night, yeah, or I'm not yeah. going to tour, you know, or I'll do very selective things if like I'm West Coast based. If there's West Coast shows, like I could do a couple select yeah, shows, like one off stuff. I, I can't go across the country and rent a van and bring four people and get two hotel rooms every night and pay a per diem. It's a thousand dollars, but I have a spreadsheet. I was thinking about publishing it uh, just so other people could kind of get a feel of the accounting and finances for touring, but don't do it, bro. Don't put yourself in a bad spot. Like this, you're already eating rice and beans as it is as an artist. So um, spend your time on reels and TikTok. Figure it out. (laughs) Don't go on the road. Do not do it. Not very glamorous, is it? It is not glamorous and like, yeah, it's just, I, I disagree with it. I don't think it's the way to grow anymore. It might've been 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, the, the grassroots method, uh, unfortunately is being phased out a little bit. You are, dude, you are much better off going to your local mall with a live stream setup of Twitch and just stand there for free and play for play music to people for free. If you want to just do that, like anything <clears throat> is better than opening for a band where everyone's just going to wait until you're off stage, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, that is the reality for a lot of, uh, young and budding aspiring musicians. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah. I did a, I did my, my first show in, in Brooklyn, uh, last September. It was the first time I ever performed. Um, and like I was doing that, you know, I did that for free just cause I wanted to, and it was still like mm-hmm. just step after step after step of like, this is a, a bit of an overwhelming process. And I was doing one show. I can't imagine doing a tour. Yeah. The logistics of a tour are crazy. Shout out to tour bus drivers and, you know, TMs. like uh, All the people that doing, make it happen. Oh, yeah. There is, you know, once you get to a certain point, like if you're making big money, like you have a whole crew and it's really like a well-oiled machine. And that's, I think, so cool. That's so dope. Would love to get there one day. But, you know, if I don't, it's okay. Yeah. I don't really like being on the road. <laughs> it's not for you anyways. No big deal. No uh, no love lost on that. Yeah, um, you're going to get COVID or you're going to get robbed. Yeah. You, I mean, you know that firsthand. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? Let's, before, we, before we move on, let's, you know, let's, let's make something positive out of doing live shows. Do you have any go-to songs? You know, songs that you think of? You know, oh, I'm doing this live show. I, I got to do this song. I've got to, whether it's for yourself or for the people, what works best live? the top 10 of your spotify don't play your new song just play what the people want dude like if you're this is a pitfall of performing live is i just try like if you're an artist and you're about to perform live your first thought is i can't wait to play a new song no one wants to hear it yeah you sound, trust me you, they didn't know play the hits like, like, yeah you sound like you sound like you've done this once or twice i do this every time i always play my new song and then i'm like not doing that again <laughs> You're like, you know what? I mean, fuck it. I'll do a song from, you know, 2018 with a couple million plays that everyone wants to hear. Yeah. Yeah. If you went to a show for someone, you know, you would want to hear the hits. You don't want to hear yeah, the, the yeah. new song. I mean, I went to a, I went to a Gorillaz show in Chicago a couple years back uh, and they didn't play Feel Good Inc. Was not played once the entire night. And when the show ended, there was like a collective groan. Like people were like, oh, fuck. Like I... S- I'm in Chicago Dude. seeing gorillas and no feel good ink. That's actually kind of sad because I, I honestly believe that the audience deserves to hear what they came for. And as an artist, you have a perspective of I've played feel good ink 
two million times. I'm not playing it tonight. <laughs> Too bad. That's your hit. Fucking play the song. It's yeah. for the audience. It's not yeah. for you. There's, you know? it, it introduces a weird dynamic. And maybe maybe you can maybe give your uh, feelings on that real quick, where this sort of dynamic between you know what the artist wants to do artistically and what they also want to deliver to the audience. You know, do, do you find that balance essentially struggling or, uh, you know, annoying? There's there's like you, you, you shouldn't consider the audience in terms of creation, right. but you should always consider the audience in terms of transactional services, merchandise, shows, conversations, yeah, pictures. They come first. You come first in the studio. And that's like that's kind of just like a fine line, like right there. Like, yeah, if you're in the public setting, you are at service. They're there for you, like, bro. Like, they're there for you. Like, oh, they're buying a, a product. Yeah, they're like, don't not let them do a return or give them bad customer service. Like, you wouldn't be here without them. Like, it's I don't really struggle with that. Only internally of thinking, like, damn, like. No one wants to hear this new shit. They just want the old <laughs> stuff. Like maybe sometimes like that, but you know, uh, yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty. Just be nice, guy. Just be yeah. pretty kind, and, and and that's all you gotta do. Not too bad. Yeah, um, but you know, you know, moving on in, in terms of you know the creation of your music and this sort of like, uh, you know, you know, evolving over time. You know, you've worked pretty frequently with a close circle of collaborators over the years. Uh, you know, Fatsy very closely, Extra Large Holiday Cards, some songs with Chinagami as well. You know, how has working with your friends and working with people very closely, uh, you know, sort of impacted your sound and impacted your growth over the years? Oh yeah, it's great. You learn from all all the homies. I always think, uh, you know, I can always learn something from from someone. You know, a lot of. Yeah. Those people you mentioned, even like in anxiety attacks and fats, he helped me learn mixing and mastering a lot over the years. And same with Polarm and, you know, Chris is really fire at guitar and like songwriting. So it's like you can always like involve yourself with dope people that make dope stuff and like you're going to learn dope things from them. So, yeah, it all, it all like it all like kind of kind of helps you out if you surround yourself with people that do shit that you think is cool, you know. Yeah. You can take a little, take some nuggets here and there. Yeah. Um. And then also, uh, I I saw something you recently posted. They kind of just, I I found interesting. It's not music related. Uh, you posted this like last week. Uh, you with the psilocybin book, right? Yeah. You said what point three uh one point one three milligrams over eight months? You said. Mm-hmm. Zero point one three uh grams. 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 Over, no milligrams. Yeah. Over eight months. Um, and uh, yeah. So how has how has that calculated usage? I I, I do have to ask. How has that calculated usage uh, Im- impacted essentially your personal and creative life? You know, what has that done for you, if anything? Oh man, the ego is dead. <laughs> the, <laughs> That's the goal, the, isn't uh, it? Yeah, like the hu- okay. So like, I think this is what psilocybin does. Is it it connects you more to the core of yourself and like the core brightness of yourself and like the highest version of yourself and helps you combat your ego where like you have your your id which is like your child like you know like the joan yeah. carl joan philosophy shit like your id your ego your super ego and like um i think that a lot of humankind's evils come from uh an unchecked id an unchecked ego and a toxic super ego so doing psilocybin can kind of dissolve the boundaries between these these steps of uh, your hierarchical psychological existence, you know? Yeah. And the more that we can get away from the very primitive lower vibrations of food, sex, all that kind of stuff, you know, like the the closer we can align ourselves to like our highest good and, you know, godliness and like pure energy and like shit like that um that's kind of how i think about it yeah that's super interesting i've i'm i'm very uh 
unfamiliar, I suppose, with the process. Um, and, and, you know, I, I always, maybe it's just because I'm, I'm mean, uh, but I always try to work in a very a tough question for the people I interview, something to really uh, get the gears in your brain turning. Um, honestly, probably just because it's fun. Uh, but we can omit okay. that this time around. I'm not going to do that to you. And, and instead, uh, we okay. can talk about another non-music related thing. Um, just very briefly, uh, cause we're reaching the end of the questions that I have for you. Um, you know, you recently announced that you're going to become a parent in July, uh, which is a very exciting life changing event. Um, so, you know, just in general, in your own words, how has the process leading up to that, you know, impacted you and your, your perspective on life? It's very real <laughs> and I am very responsible for bringing someone into the world that is a good person and and I have to teach them everything, obviously, with my partner and like my, uh, you know, family and extended family. Like they say, it takes like a village to raise a kid or whatever. Yeah. But like, you know, uh, a huge sense of responsibility. Yeah. In every yeah. sense of the way, you know, that's mostly like internally. Like it hasn't affected me yet externally that much. Besides, you know, standard pregnancy that, that medical. Mental prep and the general stuff around it yeah yeah and like helping out your partner and all that kind of thing and um it's i'm getting old about to have kids you know crazy yeah big big steps really being made here yeah it's yeah. like really crazy bro the older i get the more i just want to like be in the woods and like <laughs> gardening and planting and shit like that and like just get off not, yeah, but I can't because I'm a dad now. I got to be online probably more. So. <laughs> it necessitates that now. Yeah, you're stuck. Yeah, I think it'll be a good challenge. Okay. It'll be, it'll be, it'll be really good. I'm really excited. All right. Uh, that about does it for my questioning. Uh, we have we have an easy uh, a softball for you to, to end things out. Uh, okay. Just being that, what can people look forward to seeing and hearing from 93 Feet of Smoke in the near future? I'm working on an album right now which i think will come out in june but to be totally honest i'm not sure how loud i'm going to be like on the internet and i'm not sure how long i'm going to be on the internet and like i don't know bro it's like it's weird like i've got all these plans and stuff i want to do but you know trying to figure out where they fall and i don't know like i said earlier kind of like in a bit of a cocoon just you know yeah i'm gonna be doing my thing but laying low i'm gonna be bit. trying yeah i'm be laying low but i'm gonna be trying really hard to get back into the internet swing of things but album and you know probably some shows and you know some cool clothes and stuff like that some productions some writing standard stuff fantastic well that just about does it thank you so much for uh taking the time to talk to me today of course thank you so much for having me of course